as time is of the essence and we've already been through the procedures. Uh, without further ado, I will give the President of the Republic, Suriname, the Chair of CARICOM, the word. Chair, your remarks. Thank you, Master of Ceremony, fellow heads, sisters and brother, all the media representatives, journalists from Suriname, from the Caribbean, welcome to this press conference after the two-day summit we had of the Caribbean heads of uh, state. And uh, at stage here, we have uh, the Secretary General of CARICOM, Madame Carla Burnett. We have the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez, and he just told the conference that he is in the CARICOM business since the Treaty of Chagarama was signed. So he's the senior, very senior, very experienced. So he's here also available to address issues of the past, current issues and future issues with his wisdom. We have the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Suriname, and we have the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bahamas. As you know, Bahamas will be the uh, incoming chair from uh, January the 1st, 2023, but the Prime Minister of Bahamas uh, had to leave yesterday uh, evening, so he is represented by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, as we have come to the conclusion on this 43rd Heads of State CARICOM meeting, we can say in all modesty that we had a fruitful meeting. The 43rd meeting was attended by almost 200 delegates, 15 member states, three member states had attended the summit through hybrid participation, that means virtually, as well as physical. Four associate members, 13 institutions, one special guest, our Secretary General of the United Nations, two Secretary Generals of the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States, and the Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States, ACS, and the Saudi Arabian Minister of State. Before I share the list of all decisions with you, I want to reiterate my point of view regarding our partnership. Earlier, I stated that we must form a coalition of willingness. This is needed in order to be enabled to achieve set goals and continuity, raise the bar on effectiveness of this beautiful organization. As you head back to your specific islands and countries, I urge you to keep in consideration that this is not a time to do business as usual. We have to pave the way for future generations we have to lay firm foundations, this in order to build back better. The heads of government had a most successful and transformative meeting here in Suriname. Decisions were taken which would improve the way we conduct our affairs and ultimately the implementation of decisions to advance the integration process and enhance the lives of the people of the community. This was a major focus of our deliberations as we are determined to overhaul the business of the community to ensure the benefits of integration are enjoyed more readily by the people of the member states. With respect to issues discussed, we agreed to adopt a two-pronged strategic program of action to scale up climate finance towards building our resilience. This would entail focused and active advocacy underpinned by a regional coordinating mechanism and national capacity building to source and utilize climate finance. 
We also agreed that the resource mobilization strategy would include support from the Caribbean Development Bank to mobilize development finance. We would also advocate strongly for the allocation of concessional finance more fairly and equitable. This is a matter we, we impress upon the United Nations Secretary General, and he was very critical on this topic, and yet promised his support to our community. The Secretary General Guterres also assured the conference of his continued support and efforts to obtain debt relief, to reform international financial system, and towards the use of a multi-dimensional vulnerability index. In our discussion with the SG Chikoti of the OACPS, we urge him to have his organization to take a leading role in joining with us in the quest for re reparations. We agreed on the need to invest more time and effort in strengthening solidarity and cooperation to develop a common, strong stance in advocating on the issues of reparation and migration at the UN and other international fora. We received an update on the situation in Haiti and exchanged views with Prime Minister Henry and we took the opportunity to express grave concern at the deteriorating security situation in Haiti. And the Prime Minister had responded also that his country is looking for more support and is also calling for starting a dialogue on national level to include all the people, all the institutions, and all the stakeholders to discuss a stable and a good future for Haiti. We agreed that the Bureau of Conference of CARICOM uh, will be expanded and will include also the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Prime Minister of Barbados, Prime Minister of Jamaica, and also that we should express joint leadership, collective leadership towards Haiti. And there is a team of ministers of foreign affairs, the COFCOR will take the lead. And we have decided in Belize that a team of CARICOM under leadership of the Secretary General should visit Haiti as a site visit and also to examine the situation in Haiti. We continue to pursue our agri-food agenda to enhance our food and nutrition security and to achieve the 25 by 2025 vision, the reduction of the food import bill by 25% by 2025. In that regard, we mandated the Council for Trade and Economic Development to conclude by the end of this month the programs aimed at removal of all non-tariff barriers to intra-regional trade, particularly agriculture goods. With regard to CSME, we agreed to definitions of and qualifications for host, household, domestic, and agricultural workers and security officers, which are agreed categories for free movement within the Caribbean. We also agreed to move on the mutual recognition of companies incorporated within the members of the single market. So ladies and gentlemen, we had agreed in the past the free movement of the skilled nationals to give them the opportunity to work in the member states of the Caribbean nations. And now we have approved also labors which are not uh, really the skilled labors, but labors we need in our countries, in our sister nations, and that we have removed all the barriers for them. Agricultural labor. Agriculture and uh, also security officers, et cetera, et cetera, and domestic labors. On industrial policy, which is a portfolio that was added to Suriname's responsibilities, the conference received a presentation from Suriname on the initial work review taken by the National Committee. With the support of the CARICOM Secretariat, the CDB, and the Caribbean Export. 
a substantive paper on industrial policy was circulated for review and consideration by the member states. A ministerial task force will be established to further give body to the formulation and implementation of an industrial policy for the region. The community also looks forward to the 50th anniversary of CARICOM next year's and celebratory events are expected to take place across the community throughout a 12-month period. The meeting has presentation from the private sector, labor, and the civil society, and the dean of the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors Program representing the youth of the region also made a presentation. We congratulated, in particular, the youth of the community on their active engagement and participation in the CARICOM Youth Forum held on the 24th of June, 2022. And the Youth Summit will be held later this year in Suriname. Noteworthy is that Suriname has offered a 10 hectare of fertile land to the youth of the region. And with that, I conclude my remarks regarding the meeting. And we are available to respond on any question or remarks you may have, and I give the floor back to the Master of Ceremony. Thank you very much, and may God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the press, now is uh, your time to bring forward your questions. When you state your question, please state your name, the media you belong to, and to whom the question is directed. Who will be the first? The mics are set up at your left and your right. Yes, you can come up to the front. Good evening, everyone. Vishani from the newsroom in Guyana. Uh, to the chair of CARICOM, President Santopi, you spoke about uh, mandating quota to remove, uh, to conclude all of their programs to remove the trade, non-tariff trade barriers. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Uh, and I'm seeking clarity. In effect, does that mean that by the end of next month, uh, agricultural projects will be able to move freely throughout the Caribbean? Uh, and secondly, there was much antici anticipation ahead of the conference for a regional energy security policy. Uh, can you tell us perhaps how talks on that advanced during the conference? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, yes, there were a lot of decisions. We uh, took as a heads. What I have presented is just a summary. And those uh, questions are giving us uh, the opportunity to further elaborate on other decisions we have uh, taken. As regard the removal of barriers, I've just informed you that we removed the barriers for the domestic labors. And that was an issue, an issue we are discussing for many years. And we had declared that in our opening ceremony that we are here, that this conference should make a difference between, between this one and other conference, and that we need to take action. And we decided, we took action on all the people who were looking for opportunities in sister nations to find an opportunity as, as labor in the security and domestic and the agriculture. Well, now we have to remove all the barriers and they can have free movement and they can find labor in our sister nations. On the other side, uh, Guyana is uh, the lead head on the agribusiness. So uh, there is a comprehensive uh, strategy presented to the heads, which uh, was approved already. And there are a lot of actions planned now for the implementation of this uh, strategy. And yes, if you want to have that uh, movement of agricultural uh, products, that agribusiness, you need to remove other barriers in the area of logistics, in the area of connectivity. And that was one of the issues. The transportation issue was on the agenda. 
and we agreed and we approved also a timeline that we will decide for a comprehensive study. On one hand, how we can strengthen the connectivity among all the islands, but also to take quick steps to enable us to move forward, bringing our products to our sister nations. And we can elaborate further. Uh, the Prime Minister is also available to give you more detail. The SG is available to give you more information uh, on that. And as you may recall, when we had that meeting as Caribbean leader, CARICOM, in Los Angeles on the summit of the Americas with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, that we had agreed that there will be joint approach between CARICOM and the leadership of the United States of America on three topics, and that is food, security, that is the energy issue, and that is the climate crisis, the finance. So we had elaborated on those topics. We agreed that there will be three uh, committees on the side of CARICOM. Those committees will be led by uh, uh, prime ministers, head of states, and will comprise of experts from the Caribbean countries. And there is a follow-up already to discuss those topics with the leadership of the United States, and there are meetings planned for the coming days. There was a special uh, topic on uh, climate uh, finance, and the Secretary General can elaborate uh, on that uh, topic uh, further that uh, was uh, uh, discussed uh, thoroughly. And later on, I think the SG and also the Prime Minister can elaborate. But I think if there are no other questions on, on those uh, topics, maybe you can take all the questions. And yeah, uh, Mr. Cairo. Uh, Good evening, all. Ivan Cairo from the Warte newspaper and the Caribbean Media Corporation. Mr. President, you just mentioned the regional um, strategy for, for energy. I would like to have more on that. What, what are the, 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 the decisions that has been taken now? Within how many years should they be, be established? And also, that question is for you, Mr. President. And also regarding the industrial policy, um, could you tell us what are the main elements for this, for this policy? And I have also a question for Prime Minister Gonzales. Um, that's about the transportation and connectivity in the region. Um, we have heard uh, Prime Minister Pierre about LIAT. Could you tell us more what are the decisions within how many years, what is the time frame that this connectivity issue, this transportation issue should be, should be, should I say, as a solution? Thank you so much. Yes, um, uh, on the issue of um, uh, the industrial policy, uh, which is um, uh, under uh, the Quasi Cabinet uh, of uh, Suriname, I will ask the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of Suriname to uh, respond on that uh, question. On um, uh, the connectivity, uh, the Prime Minister can elaborate, and I'll ask uh, also the SG and the Minister to elaborate also on the energy strategy of the Caribbean. Uh, uh, Prime Minister. Thank you. Um, Excellency, in, in addressing the energy question, I don't want us to think that we are beginning with a blank slate. It's not tabula rasa. Already existing in CARICOM is a regional energy policy. There's a CARICOM energy policy. There are sub-regional energy policies, like, for instance, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. And each country has a national energy policy. And the energy policy addresses the pre-existing 
before we arrived here in, in, in Suriname, focused on renewable energy and also on energy efficiency. There are lots of initiatives and, and, and um, coordinated policies dealing with energy, renewable energy in relation to hydro, solar, wind, geothermal, energy efficiency matters concerning LEDs, um, particular types of equipment, and so on and so forth. And uh, th those, those are matters of, of, of record. What has, made them, what has made the issue of real urgency is the manipulation of the market addressing oil production and distribution, exacerbated by the Russia-Ukraine war. And clearly the prices are rising and uh, all sorts of um, products touching and concerning energy and you go also off the, the spin offs with fertilizer and the like. And, and we had to, in a sense, take in cricketing terms, a fresh guard in light of these new circumstances. There's one obvious one with the supply of energy through the Petro-Caribe arrangement, which is very favorable to several countries in the Caribbean, including, and especially so, the independent countries of the OECS, but the other countries within CARICOM. As you are aware, the unilateral sanctions by the United States administration imposed during the time of President Donald J. Trump in relation to Venezuela brought for all practical purposes the petro caribe arrangement to an end. This arrangement delivered important financing benefits to countries participating. But the agreement, the arrangement was brought to an end because the sanctions would have affected the actual shipping arrangements and the, the, the financialization um, behind this, the, the, the monetary system, the payment in dollars and all the rest of it. And the circumstances are propitious for us to call and we, we have in fact made a decision and it's in the communique and you will see it. For an end to these sanctions in relation to the, which would touch and concern the petro caribe arrangement and more broadly. But look, after all, because of what is happening in Europe, we hear that the United States of America wants to give the Europeans a carve out, a special carve out in relation to these sanctions, unilateral as they are, in relation to, to energy products out of Venezuela. We see the Americans themselves are going down to Caracas on two occasions now to see if they can make arrangements to get additional energy products. Because what is happening, we all know, we read about it, we hear it on CNN, BBC, all the networks, and those who are in the know, that the sanctions made, have, have, um, in part, made the, the, the Russians make more money from energy to help them to fund in part the war. These, these are known facts. Well, you can't on the one hand looking for carve outs for Europeans. You can't at the same time going to Venezuela looking for some special arrangement to get more oil. And then we are suffering. So it is only natural that we put this issue square on the table. And I can say this, 10 weeks ago I was in Caracas and I spoke to President Maduro about the resumption of the petro Caribe arrangement. And in fact, the decision has been made for the resumption of it, all things being equal, and with a 35% of the top up front. So clearly we want to, 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 to go and, and, and get this. Similarly, 
we know that the arrangements between um, Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela with the border, the exploitation of the LNG, where the sanctions have already had, had hit that. That is a matter which we discussed and to talk to our American friends about um, the, the, the unilateral sanctions in, in, in this regard. We are not doing this in any combative way. We are do, not doing it in any confrontational way. There's a dialogue, a conversation between friends, CARICOM and the United States of America, and the Venezuelans are also our friends. And um, this is how responsible, mature leaders are trying to address an issue which is very much in front of us. So that is a specific bundle of issues concerning energy, in addition to all the other pre-existing ones. Now, in relation to connectivity in, 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 in transportation, two bundles of issues, those concerning sea transport, marine transport, and those relating to air transport. There are two proposals, two sets of initiatives, one by Trinidad and Tobago, and one with Barbados and Guyana and other countries in relation to fast ferry transport and in relation to um, traditional ferries, movement of goods. And both initiatives were discussed in caucus with external financing. And a mechanism has been put in place to work out these arrangements and to see how we can advance either of these initiatives or to blend them together as the case may be. It's a matter of urgency. We are in early stages in, 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 in this process, but they, look, they both look promising. And one of the, the things which we have to do, we have to solve problems. The issue in relation to air transportation, somewhat of a different nature. Across the Caribbean, there are several airlines owned by the private sector, by private sector entities and by state entities. Each of those entities has its own governance structures, corporate governance structures. The government of Trinidad and Tobago owns Caribbean Airlines. CARICOM can't discuss Caribbean Airlines. That's a matter for the governance arrangements. Similarly, Bahamas Air or Suriname Air, Fly Suriname or whatever the airlines. Liat, what we have done in CARICOM hitherto is to have a new, a modern MASA, the Multilateral Air Services Agreement, to put the framework within which you will have air transportation operate. But clearly, we can't come here and those countries which were particularly in the Eastern Caribbean, the OECS countries, Barbados, and even Trinidad too, even though Cali is doing a heroic job, trying to help to, to, to make connectivity in the, in the Eastern Caribbean, and so too um, one or two other private air, air, airlines. But they, we have lost thousands of seats, because yet, as it was, is no longer before us. The, the, you didn't realize it while COVID was on, but after COVID has receded somewhat, and people are traveling again. We see the problems. So a, a discussion has taken place between the prime ministers of Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, and Guyana. The I happen to know that Prime Minister Skerritt is involved in, the, in it would, would, would be involved in this. St. Kitts, as you know, they are in an election cycle, and they didn't have anyone here to, 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 to really discuss this matter with us at that particular level. But we have taken a decision between those countries um, on the margins 
that we are going to address the issue of a, a regional air carrier of some kind. It may well be the, the revival of Liat in some form or the other, but we have to do, we have to get a, a consultant in the area of, of um, aviation to put the framework together and some numbers as a matter of urgency for us to move on. And sometime, and that, that has taken place, um, I've been given a certain responsibility to coordinate certain things um, to get that going. And then to get the terms of reference in order for such a, an exercise. And to have a, a further conversation at the leadership level, sometime in the period between the, the 20th of, of July and the end of July, um, whether the meeting will take place in St. Vincent and the Grenadines or St. Lucia, I don't know yet, to, to, to advance this question in a very practical matter. We discussed also, I would, would say, broadly, some residual issues from Liat 1974 Limited. That discussion is inconclusive, um, matters in which we do not have any particular legal obligation, but there may well be a moral obligation for us to address certain things um, efficaciously, and we will seek to do so in a coordinated way. Those are the matters touching and concerning what you have raised about those specific questions. I don't know if I've spoken with a sufficient degree of clarity. If I haven't, well, you'll have to buttonhole me <laughs> sometime and talk to me more because we have to bear in mind while we like to have this conversation going on longer. I know the president, I don't want to cut the press conference short, the president and the first lady are hosting <laughs> a dinner not too long from now. So I just want you to bear that in mind. When you, I'm not asking to curtail the free press. I just want to, he, he, he may not want to say it, but, but, but I, I would say it for him. Thank you, uh, Ralph. Uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Suriname, the question on industrial uh, policy, the update. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. President, and good evening to all. Um, I'll. Uh, start saying a couple of things before I speak about the industrial policy, but more to put it in context. Um, I think the time is right in our own region following the COVID-19 and the Ukraine crisis. Um, given all the impact it has on our economies, we all need to rebuild, reboot our economies. It's a good time to revisit our economic production structures. So setting up an industrial policy uh, task force is important in this regard. The other reason why it is important in this context currently is that the focus of the region's integration is on three things, on the single market and economy, on energy security, food security. And without an industrial policy that brings together all the three elements, um, the whole process would not be complete. So it makes sense to talk about industrial policy now but also um, to mention um, that industrial policy was always included as a specific area in the Treaty of Chaguaramas, but not very much implemented in practice. Every country had their own industrial policy. Uh, so now we're speaking about a regional industrial policy with a quasi cabinet responsibility for the president of Suriname. What we have agreed on here in this meeting is that there will be a ministerial task force with oversight by the president of Suriname to discuss much more in detail the regional industrial policy based on extensive analysis, but also in terms of the global context of such an industrial policy. Um, and in this whole endeavor, in this whole exercise, national governments will be involved, and that's why there is a ministerial open-ended task force, but also regional institutions like the CARICOM Secretariat, CDF, the Caribbean Development Fund, Caribbean Export, 
and the Caribbean Development Bank. And I'm sure that there will be need for more experts to be involved in this process. Another key stakeholder in this process is are the private sector organizations in the region. And we already know that the private sector, the CPSO, um, has an interest to contribute to this process. Um, and, and this is an alignment institutionally, regionally, but also on the basis of global developments which bodes well for the future of our economies in the region. Um, let me immediately mention two factors which are considered a limiting factor. Uh, we will need to pay specific attention to that. One is market size. If you want to become an industrial complex or industrial production, um, building industrial production capacity, you need markets. So we need to look also beyond our own markets. Apart from producing for our own, own market, which is approximately 25 million at most in the region, but we have markets close by in Central America and South America, which can be addressed as well. That's one factor which we will need to include. The second one is labor. Um, our skill set in the region is, um, is narrow, is shallow, so we will need to look at that as well. Um, it's, it's similar issues that play at the national level. Two things are critical in industrial policy as we see it for the region. One is we will need to diversify our economies. And industrial policy um, will provide that opportunity because we need to become up to a certain level, up to a certain degree independent from production elsewhere. We have seen the consequences in terms of COVID-19 with the um, vaccines where we were the last in line to be able to receive some. Um, that marginalization we need to address in all other sectors as well. So that's one, diversification, industrial policy will provide for a much more. The second one, a much better uh, economic arrangement. The second one is we need to increase value-added economic activities in our re own region. And those value-added uh, ac economic activities um, will need to be formulated and, and agreed on. That's why I spoke about priority setting earlier, is that every country has their own strength. There are three countries in the region with food processing capabilities or food production capabilities. Uh, Suriname, Belize, and certainly um, Guyana. At the same time, other countries have food processing capabilities, so it's basically aligning the strength of different countries, different islands, different countries in, on the mainland with each other and creating one economy. Again, here is the link with the single market and economy thinking. The other one is competitive advantage. That needs to be seen as a basis how we arrange ourselves in terms of industrial production in the region. As I said before, we will need a lot more information. So more analysis will be done. The ministerial task force will be composed within a couple of days, weeks, and then the first meeting will take place. The first meeting will take place as soon as possible and so we can fine tune this process. But it is a new direction for the region in which we bring all different components. And Prime Minister Gonsalves just spoke about um, sea routes and air routes. Connectivity is key, both through the internet as well as the, the virtual, as well as the physical connections. Those will be required. So this is an integral approach to regional integration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Nestor of CARICOM has uh made it easier for us uh, and showed us that we have to take into consideration the time. I want to take one question from the members of the press joining online. So Richards, if you unmute yourself, you can uh, state your question. Please do it shortly. And then we'll go to the final question uh, of the youth uh, as uh, stated. Mr. Johnson, then you will be the um, one before the last. Uh, Mr. Richards, are you on, are you able? Okay, um, while we're dealing with that technical difficulty, can I ask you to please step up and uh, do your question? Uh, 
Yes. Um, I'm sorry that you have to cut short your dinner, but you have to take my question if it's possible. <laughs> President Santoki, I am impressed by your statement at the opening ceremony, in which, in fact, you ask for Caribbean people and Caribbean people to come across and vote in Suriname and be happy and be part of the whole regional integration process in Suriname. My question to you is, given all what you have said, and again at the press conference where you spoke about the free movement of labor, now among agricultural workers, what guarantee would CARICOM people have coming to a country where, for example, there is a perceived concept that human rights issues are, are, are not above what they are, human rights problems? I, I ask that question again in particular question based on the fact that you know and I know that there is at least one CARICOM national who has been in Suriname for the last two years and has not been charged, has not been able to go to court and yet has not been able to leave your country. Just to save time, uh, would you please uh, state your question immediately then we can do two questions at a time. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Andy Johnson. I'm a journalist from Trinidad and Tobago. I work for the Trinidad Express as well as a TV station called WESN. Excellency, my, Mr. President, my question is very to you. Um, given the resolve you say that um, was, was taken at, at this meeting to, to do certain things, to take to action on decisions that you'll have made, how, how soon do you think the first um, domestic worker or the first agricultural worker will be able to move from one country to the next under the protocols that you all have put in place. And it is my, ex my, my understanding that the, the dean of the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors who addressed you all, she called for a greater involvement of young people in making decisions at the regional level. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about um, how that will happen and when, given the urgency you're talking about? And, I think I, I just want to say that I too was at the signing, was present at the signing of the Treaty of Chagaramas in July 1973. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. As regards the question on the uh, integration of the Caribbean people, the integration of uh, the Caribbean nation and the opportunity uh, what we have in Suriname and my statement that we as a country and I as a president of uh, Suriname that I'm offering opportunities to the Caribbean, the business community, the entrepreneurs. And I, re I will reiterate what my message was. The spirit of this summit of the heads of government of Caribbean states and associate members was that there must be a change, a change within the Caribbean organization, within the secretariat, within our strategy. We don't want bureaucracy. We don't want that too much talking that we need action. And I have experienced as chair of this conference that that spirit was during all deliberations on all topics of the summit. And that is a great achievement. The SG can inform you on the proposals which were made and approved also on the community governance. For example, we have decided that the heads of government shouldn't meet twice in a year on a regular session. No, we need to have monitoring of all the decisions what we are taking. So we have decided that there will be four meetings added more virtually to monitor the decision, but also to look what is hampering in the implementation of all the decisions we are taking. 
The other decision was uh, also to have a better preparation on those uh, summits by giving the lead head the responsibility to discuss properly in working groups their topics or issues which are under the umbrella of the quasi, quasi cabinet so that those summits can be proceed more effectively based on good preparation by the several working groups led by the heads. So those are some of the, but you are, if you are interested, the SG can elaborate further on that. So our strategy is, yes, we do have opportunities in the agriculture sector. And the last meeting in Belize, we had offered to the Caribbean community fertile agriculture land for joint investment. Joint investment by, for example, Caribbean enterprises. And those Caribbean enterprises should be legal entities comprising, comprising of CARICOM nationals with a clear strategy to invest over here. As Minister of Foreign Affairs, Albert Ramdin said, yes, Suriname, Guyana, Belize, we do have the cap capacity for the agribusiness, for the agriculture. And a lot of the island states, they don't have the fertile agriculture land but they do have the financial capacity. They do have the human capital. So with a good alignment, good cooperation, we can work based on win-win. The other issue of the oil and gas. Yes, we have experienced the oil and gas business towards the world. And here, there are two newcomers, Guyana and Suriname. And we have a strategy on local content. Yes, the local contest, the local business people of Suriname will get a, a preferential position. They'll get the first priority to be engaged in this oil and gas business as a direct business partner or to be partner in the spin-off of the oil and gas business. But here you can partner. And that was my invitation, all the companies of the Caribbean, you can partner with a local content follow the rules and procedure of Suriname, and register your company at the Chamber of Commerce and partner with a local content, and then you'll become a local content too. That is what I'm calling an approach based on pragmatism and not going for the bureaucracy. And where there, there are bureaucracy, yes, we as leaders, we have to remove those bureaucratic procedures, and that we have done with the issue of labor. When it can be implemented, I'll ask the uh, Secretary General, because uh, after the approval of all these decisions, the, we'll take the procedures uh, into consideration and she can elaborate further on when we can uh, start with the first uh, 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 movement of labors towards the Caribbean uh, nations. As regards uh, the guarantee, yes, we can give all the guarantee based on the Treaty of Chagaramas and other framework of uh, the CARICOM but also based on the national legislation. And we do have a lot of CARICOM labors in Suriname. For example, the, the labors from Haiti. And during our meeting here, there was a site meeting, a site meeting with a technical team from Haiti and a technical team from Suriname, discussing about strengthening the cooperation, discussing a lot, all of, a lot of issues concerning flights, concerning labor, concerning a lot of other issues. And we agreed on the heads level, president and the prime minister that will continue to have that cooperation. And that we as two CARICOM countries, we have to go for a win-win cooperation. So that is what we are doing. And the same thing will happen with the other uh, nations also. Yes, if there are some incidents and the case you are mentioning without calling any name, that case was discussed by at least two prime ministers with me. And that case is still pending in court. 
and that the person is subject of criminal investigation, and that the person has a status of suspect, he's not prosecuted yet. And there are, yes, some uh, issues uh, which are hampering uh, to expedite this case, and those uh, issues were brought under my attention, and my role is to bring those issues under the attention of the Minister of Justice and Police and the Judiciary. We have an administration system in my country, Suriname, based on separation of power, the trias politicas, and we have a provision in our constitution of non-interference in cases which are dealt at a, at a court. But sure, if there are concerns, we need to address that in a good manner, taking into account the separation of power and authority. And yes, I promise those two prime ministers that they'll bring those issues, those cases, on the intention of the Minister of Justice and Police and our judiciaries. And as regards uh, the implementation of uh, our decision on the free movement of labor in the farmer sector and other areas, SG. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, uh, Chairman. There, actually, there are two sets of decisions that were taken that are really important within the context of the CSME. Um, one was in relation to the definitions of um, categories of labor. Um, the reality was that there were just very few issues that needed to be clarified. Those issues were clarified. There's general agreement on the definitions of, of the categories of labor. Those definitions are in keeping with ILO standard definitions. What needs to be done now, because when we make decisions at the level of CARICOM, the, at the national level, the laws may need to be amended. For most of the countries, there really isn't any need to amend the laws. It is really just one or two that need to do that, and we will begin that process of working with the countries to make sure that those definitions that we agreed are, in fact, incorporated in the local laws. The second um, set of decisions was in relation to the removal of non-tariff barriers. And the, the non-tariff barriers that need to be removed are in relation to the um, protection of uh, a movement um, of biological, of animal products. Of, so they're related to agricultural regulation. They are not tariff barriers. They are non-tariff barriers. The decisions have been taken. The, the, we were in a process even before this uh, meeting um, started to have the relevant organizations, the organizations of veterinarians, the organizations of agricultural health authorities. They are supposed to be meeting and agreeing on, on all of those before the end of this month. That's, that's the information. And it is our job to now um, ensure that they do uh, re uh, sit and remove whatever um, bureaucratic processes, as, as the president refers to them, um, are sorted through so that anything that's not um, reasonable is removed. Wherever those protective regulations are there for the purpose of, of stopping transportation of, of agricultural commodities, those are, are where, um, where we need to sort it out. Um, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, uh, it's about ensuring that producers can ship their products, um, but that there is necessary um, regulation in place because we still do need to make sure that we are not moving um, agricultural produce, whether animal uh, life or meat products or, or um, fruits and vegetables that would cause um, pests to circulate uh, throughout the region. So it's really about making sure the regulatory agencies are all on the same page. It's not a, a, a removal of a tariff or a, or a preclusion of, of, of an export or an import. It's to work through the regulatory processes to make sure that products can move without increasing the risk to any of the agricultural sectors of the region. May I, may I, may, may I chair? 
if I may yes, uh, speak Prime Minister. to two related issues concerning the freedom of movement, because I think perhaps sometimes we have some confusion, both in relation to the progress we have made and not to conflate freedom of movement with other issues which are not connected necessarily with freedom of movement. The revised Treaty of Shagaramas specifies within it a number of categories by treaty which would, you would allow skills nationals to go, and there, there is a list of them. And since then, the heads of government, in accordance with the provisions of the treaty, have extended the list, and it's a large number. Journalists, for instance, university graduates, teachers, nurses, professionals of one kind or another, um, technical people, um, uh, sports persons, uh, and, and cultural uh, artists, and so on and so forth. It's a large list. And some time ago, approval was given in respect of domestic workers, agricultural workers, and security officers to be added. The definitional work and the details were not put in place. Those have now been put in place. And as the distinguished Secretary General of CARICOM has said, that some of these matters have to be now put within the domestic legislation. The protocols will be signed and go into the uh, domestic legislation, some of them you have to actually amend the legislation locally. Um, but right now, if any country wants um, in CARICOM to get agricultural workers, for instance, from another country, they can do so by agreement. In the same way as we send agricultural workers to the United States, to Canada, we now do it from St. Vincent to the United Kingdom, and so on and so forth. So that also could involve with persons who want to employ them. And, and the fact that we have approved these now would clearly make that facilitation um, much easier. Then, of course, you, any, every CARICOM national can go into another CARICOM state for up to six months, provided you're not being a charge on the state and they're not security issues. And these matters have been detailed in the Shani Mairi case out of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And the Caribbean Court of Justice is the authoritative mechanism for the determination of disputes arising from the application of the revised Treaty of Shagaramas. And its judgments are final, they are original and final in respect of the interpretation of the treaty and governments can bring cases, companies can bring cases, individuals can bring cases. So if there is a case arising from the treaty, the Shanik Mairi case has made it clear that community law takes precedence to national law in respect of the matters where the treaty or the decisions by the heads of government address that question. And that's, that's clear. And all the countries are subject to, to um, community law, except countries like the Bahamas, where the Bahamas said, we are not involved in the CSME arrangements. But the other countries are involved in the CSME arrangements. That's in order. The, the, the second issue concerns, and I know that Peter um, Richard, Richards alluded to it. The, the, the president, the president of, of, of Suriname has responded in relation to some unnamed case. I, I think we all know what it is about, and that's, he has explained that within their domestic jurisdiction. I want to say that every member state of CARICOM has signed on to the Charter of Civil Society. And there, we are, we are enjoined to respect 
the rights, the fundamental rights and freedoms of every single individual within the community, so long as they come within our jurisdiction. So that if anyone has any issue, you address that within the national jurisdiction. If it touches and concerns the issue of movement of persons and it con concerns the treaty itself, well, then you go to the CCJ. And I think it's, it's important that we make distinctions between two different sets of issues, juridically and at the same time to reaffirm that our region is a region which upholds the values in the charter of civil society. And no government can run afoul of those values. If they do, within their own domestic jurisdictions, they have the right of redress. If it touches and concern, I repeat, the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, the CCJ, in both, in its original jurisdiction, addresses those matters authoritatively. So I hope I bring some clarity, um, Andy, both to the question you raised and the one that Peter um, uh, um, gave to us. Thanks. Thank you, Prime Minister. And uh, I'll ask the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Bahamas to respond to some of the questions. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And I just want to switch gears for a minute here to highlight some other aspects of the concluding or the outturn document of this meeting, <clears throat> which were important to us. Uh, first of all, the pronouncements on Haiti. Uh, Haiti is an important member of, the, of CARICOM, and uh, the document reaffirms the support for Haiti and the fact that the UN mission ought to be renewed, uh, the continued support should be there for Haiti, and that there's going to be a mission by CARICOM to Haiti to help with the process of uh, reconciliation, rebuilding, restoration for Haiti. And uh, the Bahamas, which is 90 miles to the north of uh, Haiti's northern border and perhaps the closest state, apart from the Turks and Caicos Islands, which is a dependent territory of the UK, is keenly interested in continued support for Haiti. Uh, Haiti has paid a very bitter price by those who, once Haiti became free, uh, imposed so many uh, burdens on that society that it has not had an honest chance to develop. And it is up to us, we believe, in CARICOM to continue to be a forceful advocate for Haiti uh, in the international space. Uh, secondly, along the same lines of democracy, uh, there, was a, there is a strong statement of support for the Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands. Uh, we were quite forceful in speaking to the British about the whole idea of imposing direct rule on the Virgin Islands. Uh, I myself had a meeting, other ministers in the, in the margins of the Summit of the Americas to talk about uh, BVI, and uh, the British have decided that they will not, at this point, impose direct rule, but they have reserved the possibility of doing so. Uh, this, therefore, hangs over BVI like the Sword of Damocles. We think that ought to be removed. Uh, the people of BVI ought to have an honest, fair opportunity to straighten out their own affairs. Um, and we think that they are capable of doing so. Uh, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent made a very impassioned, and, and the Grenadines made a very impassioned statement which rang, rang true to me. And that is, the wealth which exists in BVI today was actually built up by the population of BVI. So they constructed it, and they have a right to be able to set right whatever went wrong without the interference of an outside power. And that's the position which this statement, which comes out of this outturned document uh, today, I think does. And not to cut you that we are emphatic that the, the British government must remove the sword of Damocles, which addresses the question of a potential reimposition of direct rule. We view that as anachronistic and a return to Crown Colony government. I, it is unbecoming 
of the British government in the third decade of the 21st century to have the sword of Damocles hanging over a free people in this manner. And I'm, sh I'm quite sure that they would see the inconsistency, nay, the hypocrisy in the behavior of certain persons in the British Parliament and the way things have happened there in relation to the BVI. The book of Matthew tells us you must take the moat out of your eye when you try to take the beam out of somebody else's own. We have to stop this kind of hypocrisy and nonsense. The British are our friends, and we must talk frankly and straightforwardly to our friends on this issue. So that the, the third point I wish to make, thank you, Prime Minister. The third point I wanted to make was about the uh, oil prices worldwide. Uh, the Bahamian Prime Minister, Philip Davis, made a statement shortly before uh, coming here to the meeting uh, about sanctions against Venezuela and the inability of Venezuelan oil to be introduced into the marketplace in the normal market mechanisms. And our view is it is time for us to, for those sanctions to be removed, uh, to allow for uh, Venezuelan oil to enter the market. We believe even the pos just the possibility of saying so has led, in fact, to uh, prices going in a downward direction. Uh, so this outturn document, again, makes the point that uh, there ought to be a free return to the market mechanisms uh, and the Petro Caribe uh, program, which existed before, assisted and helped Caribbean states uh, with the question of energy prices. And uh, we in the Bahamas, of course, uh, energy is really private sector driven and not public sector driven. But certainly with the uh, scrapping of the sanctions would in fact come uh, a positive impact on pricing and cause a drop in the price of oil, which is a practical issue for citizens across the region. Uh, it's left only after my saying that uh, for me to thank again the president of uh, Surinam for his kind reception. Uh, you've gone out of your way, Mr. President, to make sure all of us are comfortable and feel home. And I thank also my colleague, the foreign minister, for his assistance as well. And uh, this is my first, my time back. The f I was here last in 2005. Uh, this is my third time as foreign minister, and I'm, I'm pleased to be back. And uh, I planted a Gnep tree. And uh, I was saying to, I think, to the Prime Minister that uh, my understanding is Gnep trees are male and female, and only the female trees bear the fruit. So I'm hoping we'll find out in short order when I come back whether it's a female tree or male tree. I'm hoping it's a female because I love Gnep. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much and yes. blessings. Thank you. As the youth hold the yes. future is, uh, it's, one, one, uh, yes, Chair? Uh, more, but uh, you know, this is uh, the, uh, advantage if you come with question then you will notice how many deliberations we had and how many decisions we took there will be a communicate coming from the secretariat uh, coming hours maybe tomorrow morning with uh, all the decisions uh, uh, we took but uh, uh, on the issue of planting trees yes uh, uh, also uh, based on the uh, anniversary next year the 50th anniversary of uh, CARICOM we had planted 15 trees, 15 trees by all uh, the CARICOM um, uh, heads. So I urge them that they have planted the tree and they have to come every year to take care of their trees. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask the SG. Uh, to Mr. President, uh, one more thing. It's left me also, uh, sorry, also for me to say, uh, Nassau is the site of the next meeting. It'll be 50 years of our independence next year, 50 years of CARICOM and we expect you to lead the way to Nassau in February of next year. We'd be pleased to host you. Great, and, all the and we'll see the, fruit, the fruits of the tree in Nassau. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will ask the SG. We should bring it to an end now. Yeah, I will ask the SG, very uh, uh, short and to the point, uh, to address the question on um, the, uh, the Dean of uh, the Youth Ambassador and the decision we took. Mm -hmm. And then with that, we'll finish. Uh, yes, Mr. President, um, we had a really good presentation from the youth ambassador speaking to youth involvement in regional decision making. Um, we, this was preceded, as you heard, by a youth forum 
uh, first of its kind for a long time, where we brought the young people, the youth ambassadors, the CARICOM youth ambassadors, along with uh, youth groups, youth representatives, other um, stakeholders in, in youth. Um, together, they had a good discussion. They're talking about their priorities, their important things, the things they need to see happen, what they would want the community to pay. Uh, priority attention to, and they spoke, the, the dean of the youth ambassadors spoke to those issues um, when she addressed the heads this afternoon. Um, two things, the CARICOM youth policy is being renewed because it's one of the things that's really important. That wasn't raised, but we are in the process of doing so within um, the CARICOM secretariat. Um, and the second thing is that the government of Suriname has offered to host a summit of young people here in Suriname before the end of the year. The, the involvement of young people um, is seen as very critical. All of the heads spoke um, and are really um, enthusiastic about the nature of the, the conversation that was had with the, the young people, both at the youth forum and in the meeting today. So um, great congratulations were given to the, the Dean of the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors and great encouragement to the young people to continue to meet, discuss their own needs so that when we meet and bring them together and meet with them as well, they are in a position to articulate their own needs and, and from what they need and also from what they want to contribute to the community. So it's a really excellent discussion with the young people and we will continue with that. Thank you very much, uh, SG. Uh, two, uh, more information as regards the youth. As you know, uh, the youth uh, policy for uh, the Caribbean is under the umbrella of uh, the Quasi Cabinet, uh, under the responsibility of Suriname and uh, the delegation of uh, uh, Suriname uh, had offered to the Caribbean community a, a piece of fertile land of 10 hectares for the students, for the young people of the Caribbean to uh, carry out their study on biodiversity, on climate change, on technology, everything which can lead to create a better future for the young people and to save our planet. And that over will uh, formalize the coming days and that will be elaborated during the Youth Summit in uh, uh, Suriname. And finally, we were also uh, uh, honored by uh, the uh, attendance of the newly elected Prime Minister of Grenada, a young leader very young leader, and I invited him to join me and to support me in strengthening the youth policy for the Caribbean. And he confirmed that he will join me and the Quasi Cabinet to give a further strengthening of the youth policy in the Caribbean region. Having said it, I will thank you all for uh, attending the press conference. I Thank you all for all the questions, and I'll give the order of this press conference back to the Master of Ceremony, Alfon Roosevelt. Chair, if we can have one more, uh, one more minute of your time. Uh, as the youth have uh, the future, Safa Ajako and Matai Samuel as, uh, as youngsters have a question from uh, the Caribbean Youth Program. So can they please uh, do their question quickly? everyone my name is Safa um, my question is directed to oh, my question is directed to President Santoki chairman um, President Santoki invited Grenada's newly elected Prime Minister Dickon Mitchell on Sunday to formulate Car CARICOM's first ever youth policy my question is which countries were represented by youth so far thank you Well, what I've noticed during uh, this conference. 
time. Could we have the second question okay, from the youngsters? Yes. Everybody, my name is Matai Samuel. I'm here for the Caribbean Media Center. Uh, Chair, acknowledging your position as lead head with youth in your portfolio, what concrete actions have been outlined to facilitate the systematic inclusion of the insights of youth? How are you going to ensure the full participation of all Caribbean youth in executing these actions? And how many of these actions will be taken before yet another, yet another fruitful conference is held? So next to the Tropical Innovation Campus and campus and next to the youth summit to be held in October what are you doing right now to implement the voices of youth thank you very much if uh, you have listened to the secretary general then you heard what we are doing right now right now we took the decision comprehensive strategy comprehensive decision based on the proposals of the Dean of the youth ambassador that we as heads took the decision to give support and all the actions proposed by the dean, all the actions were approved by the heads of conference. So now we have to implement. And a part of the implementation, we'll ask the young people, the youth, to elaborate on that during the youth summit over here. I don't want that the elderly people should have that discussion for you. You have to discuss that. You have to decide what type of future you want and don't leave it to the leaders. That's the responsibility I'm giving you now, what you're asking. And you're asking about the involvement of the countries and which had represented the youth. Well, I can tell you, for example, Mr. Ralph and more of the leaders, maybe they don't have the age of a young people, but they have the spirit, they have the energy, they have the fuel, and they have the strength also of a young people. And that had energized us during this conference, and that had led to that decision. And I'm inviting all the young people to make good use of the campus, take lead, and you will get the support of the Caribbean leaders. You will get support of the CARICOM Secretariat. And our request had been submitted to the international financial institutions and donor organizations to provide their technical assistance. Also in setting up this campus so that next year, on the celebration of the 50th anniversary, we can say, yes, there is the result of the decision we took today with contribution of the young people. Thank you very much. And thus we have come to the conclusion of this press conference. Can we please rise so the President and the other Excellencies can make their way?